everybody in the Congo. It's a pleasure to be with you again uh, as we go into the fifth video on how to minister effectively to people with mental illness and addiction. Uh, so I just want to thank you uh, for your commitment to um, help those who can't help themselves and to work with those who most of the people in the in your community and in the communities around the world uh, will distance themselves from, will not take care of. So I thank you for your commitment and I pray God's blessings upon you so that you may effectively minister to uh, these individuals and as a result that you will be ministered to as well. My experience as, uh, as a former pastor and somebody who's still in ministry is that oftentimes as I'm helping others, uh, God helps me. Um, there is a song here in the United States uh, written by a gentleman named Chris Rice in which he talks about when in the song, when you talk, when you are ministering to those who are less fortunate than you, that we actually see the face of, face of Christ at that point. So I'm praying for you and I'm praying that as you minister to this group of people, um, that you see the face of Christ and that you're drawn closer to him. So today, what I wanted to talk to you about in this video is um, the needs, uh, beginning to talk about some of the needs that people have in general, and not just people with mental illness and addiction, but people in general. And so certainly the people who live with mental illness and addiction need these perhaps to a greater extent. So before we get started, let, let's pray. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, thank you so much for your love and mercy and grace. I pray today as I record this video and when my brothers and sisters in Christ listen to the video, that you will make, yourself, make your presence known and may, may your name be glorified. Teach us, empower us, and show us your face in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, one of the things that we have learned in psychology and uh, for people in general, but also for people who live with mental illness and addiction, one of the things that we've learned is perhaps the most important need that a person has is the need to be loved and to feel like that they belong. So the need to feel loved and to feel like that they belong. So everybody wants to be loved and everybody wants to feel that they belong or matter to somebody else. Isn't that true? Don't you want to feel like you're loved and that you belong? Isn't that one of the values of the community of Christ? That people feel like, they, feel like that they belong to this community? And when people do feel like that they belong to a community, there are so many psychological benefits and emotional benefits to that that it's really difficult for us as psychologists to measure the importance of belonging. We know that people, uh, that everybody on the planet wants to know that they are loved and that they belong to somebody else. So people want to know that they, they matter to you. People want to know that you they are important to you and consequently that they are important to God. And so you and I as ambassadors of Christ, we have a very significant role in effectively demonstrating God to people and helping them understand that they belong to Christ, that Jesus Christ died for them. That includes everybody, including those who live with mental illness and addiction. So psychologists have learned that the, that the greatest need a person has to, is to know that they're loved and feel they belong. Um, in fact, one of the things that we have learned by accident 
actually in our field is that when people are isolated, they tend to get less healthy and many of them will tend just to die because they are isolated. In fact, there were some unfortunate studies done in Nazi Germany during the uh, Great Depression uh, and World War II in which the German psychiatrists actually isolated babies uh, who were newly born. They fed them and they uh, gave them liquids, but they did not give them any interaction or very, very minimal interaction with other humans. And they found that out of those 100 babies that they were experimenting on, 95 of them died within a few weeks of birth. And the explanation is, is that those babies died because they didn't feel like that they belonged or mattered to anybody. That's the importance of what we're talking about today. That the people who live with mental illness and addiction in your community and in my community need to feel like that they matter and that they belong to you and to God, that, that they're important. Um, so because of this knowledge, we have a tremendous responsibility and we can, we can be a tremendous blessing to those people who simply by living with uh, mental illness feel quite isolated and feel like that they don't belong. So something as simple as you and your community ministering, connecting to people does a huge benefit for those individuals to be more healthy. Studies have shown that, that uh, for example, um, psychological studies have shown that when people experience a trauma, perhaps it's a, a rape or trauma from war or trauma from some other kind of violence or abuse, studies have shown that when individuals experience a trauma, if they can tell somebody about the trauma and feel accepted and loved for who they are and not given the responsibility for what occurred to them, then they are much more likely to be able to absorb the trauma and the trauma would not have as significant as a negative impact as it would if the person who experienced trauma did not get support from their community or their church or their family. So the significance of you helping people who live with mental illnesses, either the brain-based mental illnesses or the emotionally-based mental illnesses, the impact that you can have by simply having a relationship with these individuals and their families is tremendous. So I'm going to encourage you today to really work hard at building a relationship and connecting to people who live with mental illness and addiction and help them understand that they are important to you and that they are important to God. So let's talk through a little bit of what the scripture may teach us about this aspect of connecting to people. So a couple quick stories from the Gospels. First of all, in a previous video, we talked about the parable of the Good Samaritan. So let me go back and touch on that parable and just pull out a few points. This is from Luke chapter 10. So in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus points out several things. That the Samaritan in the story, when he sees the person who's been robbed and beaten and, the, and that person is laying by the side of the road, the Good Samaritan does several things. And we talked about this in a previous video, but let me just point it out in the context of today's teaching. So the Good Samaritan did a few things. Number one, he saw the person. So I don't believe that that means that he just saw him with his physical eyes. Certainly that was, is part of it. But he saw him and paid attention to him, the one who was robbed and who was beaten. He saw him, and then he went to the person. 
So there was something he saw about the person that created some empathy, some feelings, some emotions towards this individual. And because of him seeing the person and being stirred up or having some compassion for this person, then he went to them. We remember what the previous two people who had walked up to the beaten man did. They were religious people who didn't go to him. They saw him as well, and they crossed the street and avoided him, like many people in our communities do with the mentally ill. So the Good Samaritan is the one who sees the person, and then he goes to where he's at. Thirdly, he took the Good Samaritan then took care of his needs. That implies that he learned what the person's needs were. And how would he have learned what the person's needs were? He probably had some discussion with the person, saying, how can I help you? What are the, the needs that you have? Help me understand you a little bit better. Help me understand what your life has been like. Then at, more than likely, as he began to understand what this man's life was like, then he was much more able to address the needs of this man. So how does this help us? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Another story in uh, the Gospels is a story, and there's several of these stories, where Jesus interacts with people who are demon-possessed. What's very interesting is that Jesus does not avoid interacting with those who are demon-possessed. In fact, there's a case where the man who's demon-possessed comes to Jesus. Jesus doesn't push him away. He interacts with them. There's another story where Jesus goes to the demon-possessed person and interacts with them. It's the same principle from this parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus saw them and had compassion on them and had a little bit of a discussion with them even at minimum, casting the demons out. My point here is not that people with mental illness or addiction have a, are possessed by a, a demon. My point is, just like the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus saw them and he interacted with them and addressed their spiritual needs. Uh, also, in um, Deuteronomy chapter 7, and 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we were taught we were once lost and now we are, um, we are to proclaim the excellencies of God. That's 1 Peter 2 and I think it's verse 5. So in other words, we were once lost just like the people you are ministering to are lost or were once lost. And what we are to do is to proclaim the excellencies of God to people with mental illness and addiction. So how do we do that? Well, I think you probably know how to do that. Part of what I would encourage you to do, specifically with people who live with mental illness and addiction, is that you help them understand that the excellencies of God means he wants them healed. And he wants them freed from addiction. And he wants them to know that he cares about them, that he loves them, and that they belong to him. And that you represent God to them. You are God's ambassador to that person. And so we have several stories here where Jesus, uh, in two, um, uh, well, I'm sorry, several stories in which Jesus is talking about seeing the person in need moving towards them, and then interacting with them and meeting their needs. What a model for us to interact with people who are less fortunate than we are. So I want to give you some practical things to do, some basic level things to do. Number one, um, I would teach you to not see people who with, with mental illness as being sick. 
some some of the individuals that you meet with mental illness and addiction do have a brain disease. And so I would encourage you that you see them in the same way as you might see others with other illnesses, say with cancer or heart issues or breathing problems, that you see them in the same way, that you see them and that you feel compassion for them. But don't automatically conclude that everybody that's having an emotional problem is sick. Perhaps they've experienced a trauma and the reaction to that trauma is very normal. It just looks different than what people who've not experienced trauma. Okay, so number one, see the mentally ill and the addicted uh, uh, not as people who are sick. Secondly, go to where they're at. Go to where they are at. Meaning, uh, go to where they're at physically. If they are, are uh, homeless, go to where they are in, the, in your community. If, they're, if they live amongst some trees, go to, go to that place. Don't wait for them to come to you. Go to them. Physically, move yourself to where they are at. Also, go to them mentally. Meaning, start talking with them and try to understand from their perspective what their life has been like and what needs that they have. Much like what the Good Samaritan did with the man who was beaten and left on the side of the road. Also go where they are at spiritually. Meaning start asking them about their relationship with Jesus and what they think about Jesus. And start telling them about Jesus. But also spend, I would teach you to spend the majority of the time learning about them. And again, learning about their story from their perspective. Go visit them wherever they're at. If they're in families, if they're, at, if they're homeless and living on the streets, if they're in your community, go to them. Secondly, I'll teach you to, to uh, ask them about themselves. Don't talk about you. Don't talk about God initially. Talk to them about themselves first. And again, try to understand their life from their perspective. Seek to try to understand their perception of God. It probably would not be surprising for many of them to feel like God has abandoned them. Because if they're now, if they're potentially homeless, if they have a disease that affects the brain, which is the very body organ that helps them perceive the world, they may have a different perception of God than you and I do. They may feel abandoned. They may, may feel like God has done this on purpose towards them. So try to understand their perception of God. And then as you interact with them, you can start demonstrating the accurate perception of God from the scripture. The other thing I would say to you too is in many communities around the world, including the one that I live in, there are some commonly accepted ways for people to interact with one another. These are what, what I would call community standards or expectations about how we should interact with others. Unfortunately, in many communities, we are taught not to interact with people who are very different than us and that uh, may be acting bizarre, at least according to our definition of bizarre. One of the things that I think is very powerful in the Gospels is that Jesus cares more about people than he does about those community expectations as to how we should interact with one another. Think about this. In the Jewish community in the first century, it would not, it would, uh, the reason why demon possessed people were chained to rocks or they were cast out of the community is because the community standards and expectations were that they should not interact with the demon possessed. 
Yet Jesus goes right to where they are. He violates all the community standards to help the person, individual. That's how important the individual person is to Jesus. He violates all these social norms. Think of, about in John chapter 8, the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. The religious people wanted to stone her and, were, and violated all sorts of their own social norms. And Jesus cared more for the person than the social norms of the religious hypocrites. So, if there are certain expectations in your community about how one should interact with people with mental illness and addiction, and if those community expectations are not helpful to that individual, I'm going to encourage you to disregard those community expectations and go to where that person is at and see them move towards them and meet them where they're at learn about them minister effectively to them don't be afraid about by what you see or hear either don't be afraid by what you see or hear jesus wasn't with those who are demon possessed the woman who's caught in adultery and so many other stories jesus wasn't afraid jesus just interacted with them you may Witness some things that are pretty bizarre and that will make you feel uncomfortable. Just know that you have the Holy Spirit with you. He will protect you and he will guide you. Have faith in that. So, move to where the person is at. Meet their needs. Understand what their needs are from their perspective, not from yours, from their perspective. Tell them about Christ. Help them to understand the accurate picture of Christ according to the scripture. So in closing today, I want to say this. Um, I'm very proud of you all. And I think what you are embarking on and what you are all trying to do is an amazing journey. So my, my prayer for you is that God will help you, will open up your eyes, help you to see people for who they are as men and women who are created in the image of Christ. And that, that they are not actually less than who you are. They are people in need of Christ, much like you are in need of Christ and that you were in need of Christ. So I'm proud of you. I'm praying for you all the way over here in the United States. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video, teaching you the next principle and perhaps next summer being able to come to you and meet you all face to face. Thank you and God bless you. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.